Yes, I'm recording. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Let's recap the, the paper stuff for the people. Back to recording. Okay, so we were talking on Friday about abstract expressionism. Um, and within the broader category of abstract expressionism, um, there are two primary subcategories that are part of it. And one of them is uh, action painting, where an artist's uh, gestures really become part of the subject matter of the work, in a way. In other words, once it's done totally abstract, right, there's no representation in many of these. And once that happens, when all you have left is the traces of how the artist put the medium onto the canvas, um, the subject matter kind of becomes how did the medium get onto the canvas, right? It becomes action painting. It, it, it traces the actions of the artist. It traces the gestures of the artist. And uh, in many ways, this is uh, can be tied directly to a very prominent kind of, I hate to use the word because it's belittled, but a sort of a hip form of psychoanalysis from the 40s, which was Jungian, Carl Jung, J-U-N-G, uh, who said that uh, one of the ways to get in touch with your true self here, you know, to get past all the junk that keeps you from sort of, you know, being in touch is to is to is to think about your actions and your role in determining those actions. That all of your actions are your own decisions, right? And so, action painting is in many ways uh, we can say is, is probably close to think to this because many of the artists we're talking about, um, Gorky and Forza, which really kind of psychological messes, and many of them are actually in psychoanalysis, going through psychoanalysis at the time. Uh, which, if you've ever seen a Woody Allen movie, is kind of like a status symbol thing. He lives in New York, you know, they have a good animal. So, um, the connection to psychoanalytic theory is strong with them, as it had been with the surrealists, right? Where, for them, it was Freud. For them, it was the idea of the subconscious realm. But what we look at as Friday is the degree to which abstract expressionism really takes on ideas from surrealism and, and develops them further in slightly different ways. So the idea of actual painting obviously has its roots in automatic painting, which the surrealists were practicing. Right? The idea of letting an open start, a trace line on the canvas, determine the composition irregardless. That's not a word. Regardless, here regardless is redundant. It's here redundant. Thanks for smiling. Uh, here, regardless of the subject matter, you start with just, you know, the open start, right? And so, uh, for me, row, some of that is there with the trace lines that you see that eventually become a little figure. And with Gorky as well, it looks like it might well be a still life. Maybe with, I don't know, are those human species on the left of those noses and eyes and whatnot? Right? On the far left, of the white profiles. Uh, but it is, seems more as if it's based on kind of an open start idea. A little bit more rectilinear uh, than many of our surrealists who are much more um, organic than this. But uh, certainly linked to that. One of the things we saw, part of the reason to talk about other modernists prior to uh, the abstract expressionists was to, was to really focus on this uh, idea that uh, there's a certain American brand of surrealism, a certain American brand of, of quasi-automatic painting that seems to have a very strong influence on this guys, right? And so we talked about that one Friday as well. And we also talked about the ongoing influence of some of our early modern masters, especially the classic who lives all the way to the 70s, right, and continues to produce in a sort of chameleonic way, changing his style all the time, for decades and decades and decades. And many of his works become touchstones because they get rediscovered, some of the early stuff. But artists are also very much following what Picasso is doing, even though he's a little foggy by comparison, 
right? Uh, a generation older. They still are interested in where she's going, and certainly some of these works from the 30s, by the prophet, is also channeling surrealism. But he's also very much interested in the vigorously applied paint, right? The idea of almost action painting, although he never abandons his attention, right? This is why they have titles like the Inclining Woman, where he leaves the breasts and the buttocks, right? It almost looks like maybe it's a abstract version of that Ang painting of the, of the harem girls from the early 19th century, or a Titian, a uh, Venus picture, right? Uh, and the face, you know, on the far right, this is, you know, you can see these are the more, oh, sorry about that, uh, These are the arms here, this is the head here, right? And then the body comes down and goes to the feet down there. And uh, at the same time, it's, it's abstracted enough that they do some compositional elements and almost have a, a gestural quality to them. This interest in Picasso we were also discussing at the very end of class on Friday, where uh, this early work by Picasso, the young ladies of Adam's which is about seven foot square, it's huge, it's a monster, um, came out of hiding, if you will, came out of uh, a private collection, finally it entered the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York um, in, I think it was 1937, right? Really quite late. I don't the date, uh, I have to look it back up again. Yeah, 19, 1937. Uh, Nova bought it and it made a huge splash. And for our abstract expressionists living in New York, this new access to a work of art that had hardly even been reproduced in print, let alone seen outside of a private collection, uh, it was a new work for them. And just as Picasso fragments his women and uses those fragmentation to cover the entire canvas with, you know, uh, repercussions of those figures, right? Echoes of those figures. Uh, uh, the Kuhn is very much the same thing. And just as Picasso renders some of them frightening and ugly, the two on the far right in particular, in Picasso's work, so too the Kuhn takes the paragon of beauty, the female nude, right? Which has always been used in art, going back to the ancient Greeks, as a way of demonstrating a knowledge of perfect harmony and beauty and structure. The female form, even more than the male form. Maybe with the Greeks, okay, but, you know, on the norm. And he's subverting that. Right? The work is entirely uh, difficult. And on a certain level, I don't think there's any direct connection to Kirchner, but they both deal with this idea of an art that isn't beautiful. You know? And I think it's a conscious decision on their part to push it that particular So, uh, the decoding work on your left, woman, was the beginning of a huge series of literally hundreds of paintings that the Kuning did. In fact, that band is coming across the bottom. I don't know, I think it's because I went out and came back in again to this, but you can't see the very bottom of the pictures, but you can online. Uh, literally hundreds of these works over decades, right? The Kuning doesn't die until somewhere in the 80s, I think, late 80s or so, and he continues to work the woman series and all of this. And you can see with this one, um, while we have fleshy tones, right, we can make out arms and legs and a sort of yellow tutu sort of thing, right, you can also see that the, the head has been utterly fragmented and uh, I guess the opposite of beautified, right, is uglified. <laughs> I'm making that word up. I'm pointing it right now. Um, where her face is pregnant, and we see the teeth of that nose and the eyes sort of broken apart. It's almost as if he took a, a hatchet to it all. Something very violent about his work, but I think part of that is also the fact of action taken, right? It records his movements in front of the canvas, the actual application of the paint. And you'll notice that it also repeats. So in the middle of the, of the canvas, right across where her belly button probably would be, is another mouth disembodied from the face, right? It's repeat more or less the form of the mouth of the bottom, the same mouth that you see here five years earlier on the left. Uh, but it's, it's scrubbed with rather poorly applied lipstick, 
right? Again, vigorously applied, um, emphasizing that idea of the gesture. Color choices, like character back in the aught, um, jarring and difficult. Uh, deep grit, red, butting up against those yellows and greens. Uh, bits of blue that really have no descriptive purpose whatsoever. And everything placed, if you look through here, for example, Right, that area right there, you get the sense of these broad, uh, vigorous gestures that are at the, the base of this. And again, that goes back to this idea of what is action painting. Uh, whereas Gorky went in almost entirely uh, abstract, non-representational. Kuni does it, but still he, he foregrounds the idea of the gesture. It becomes part of the ideas the artist is trying to is the importance of the gesture. Yeah. Um, so, all of these uh, pieces that he did, he did with you, he did them alone. Yeah. He didn't put a few of them or like... No, I didn't. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing. And I, I, I'm curious, because I've never looked at Monty and Dino, but that's a good question. Why are they numbered? Um, when you number things, you suggest sequentiality. Just series and development, and A leads to B leads to C, right? So this is dude number one, or woman number one, woman number two. Then it almost guides you as a viewer to suggest that you should look at them in sequence. And this is just a guess now, right? That not much, of, but this is my guess about why you didn't do that. That's exactly right, and I think what what the clue was. It's for each one to stand on its own. I think each one of them becomes a site for immersion on the part of the viewer or for immersion on the part of the kid, right? Because really, uh, this idea of action taking and the uh, foregrounding of uh, the gesture of the artist, the action of the artist, the recording of those actions, um, you know, the, the painting is kind of the artifact of what the real art making in the abex, abstract, that's a top 50, abstract expression, abex, right? But the real art of abex is not the finished product. The real art of abex is the work in that, right? It's the actual activity between the artist and the medium. And this is just a trace of that. This is just what's left from that activity. The activity is the most important. And maybe you, in tracing the artist's activity, can, can join in with that, right? Um, this is why we had, you know, five more weeks <laughs> if you want to do that. But, um, and we got to, for example, performance art. You know, aren't we kind of at a form of performance art here, right? Where it is the performative nature of the artist that we are really looking at. The difference is, of course, that with performance art, you end up with nothing to look at for those traces except maybe photographs or recordings, rather than something that falls into the more traditional camp of a work of art. Right? And that's why, in many ways, um, you know, modern art is always, I think there's this thing about modern art where, and this is not just my own idea, um, where in many ways, if we look at the history of modern art, it really is like um, a baton race. You know? Where somebody grabs a baton, runs their leg of the race, and hands it off to somebody else to take that baton further. You know? The ex uh, head of the Museum of Modern Art, Kirk Barnesdale, uh, who passed away rather young, he only was 40 when he died. Anyway, he, he wrote a little introduction to modern art that talked about modern art as being like a rugby match. And he played rugby in college, right? And he said, with a rugby match, the whole place would move the ball down the field and keep the ball moving, right? And that's almost better than a, uh, because you can move laterally, you know? But the whole point is to hand the ball off and keep it moving. And that modern art can be seen as handing the ball off and keeping it moving. So, the ball has been handed from the row and the surrealists now to abstract expressionism. We turn around and hand it off to somebody else. And this is going way away from you. 
But one of the things we'll talk about with Abbess is also that Audrey comes back into the picture in an odd way. In Abbess, yeah. I think that there's a really good thing to talk about. Maybe it's coming up. I don't want to get ahead of myself to this. I don't want to jump forward to the slides to jump back to this. Right? 
The other thing is kind of know when to quit. Right? If you're in it like that and you're just in it and really maybe because maybe you're thinking it's not really worth I don't want to worry about when to quit. He knows. And he hasn't worked up the bottom bits of the picture. That's bare canvas thing. And he actually signs it in chalk on the bare canvas. Right? At the bottom of the one on the left. Um, so these things I think this is this intuitive knowledge of, of the page, which is what I do admire about doing. My, my brother's a painter, um, and he loves to cook. And his stuff doesn't anything like He actually adores to cook his work. And, and yet his work is much more peaceful, kind of slow, fancy, and sort of stuff. And, and I think it's a bigger, it's a muscle, if you will. I don't know why you can make terms of it. But you know what I mean? It's that vitality that's there is, I, I think, what many people uh, look at. So, again, we've been talking about uh, these action paintings um, and their relationship to Carl Jung, uh, the great psychoanalyst, who had this idea of a collective unconscious. So it's different from the subconscious, right? The subconscious is the realm of dreams or the realm of uh, opiates, right, uh, being high, if you can be. Uh, subconscious, but the unconscious is very different from that. Right? The collective unconscious is this sort of primal, uh, primal level of understanding that we all share. That goes back to our earliest roots as humans, right? If it's Judeo-Christian, it's Adam and Eve, right? That, uh, that sense that they were formed from the earth and they share something. And we have all shared that as well. Um, and in order to tap into that collective unconscious, one of the things that Jung said is we had to be aware of our actions. And he called it self-actualization. Right? And these pictures, whether we're talking Borky or Dukunin, are very much aware of their own actions. They're recording their own actions. And this is what ties these early abstract expressions to uh, this kind of psychoanalysis. It's not the first time we've seen this, right? The surrealists were there as well. Which is, again, that interest in psychoanalysis, I think, is part of this, that ties these two movements very closely together. So, if um, self actualization, is being aware of your actions, gets you to the collective unconscious, and the collective unconscious is what we all share as humans. Then these pictures, the intention of the pictures, not sort of just for, for just for Takuni. It's for us to hopefully understand what we share with everyone else because of the record of the action. It's a way to get to the unconscious, the collective unconscious. I know this is a really um, it's out there as a way of understanding. You don't have to do well in an essay or to pass the class. You do not have to be an expert on Jungian psychology. Goodness knows, I'm not. Right? But it's important to realize that there's more to this than simply making compositions. That there's these ideas that are behind it that are very, very current in the, in the 40s and in the 50s about uh, what it means to make a mark, what it means to uh, reflect on your actions. It was the spirit of the age, if you will, uh, that these paintings are, are very much in tune with. Yeah. I'm sure we do, but I do not know anything about his process. You mean like, uh, how did he lay out his canvases? Yes, I'm sure you can find that. So most of the stuff is very well recorded, in fact. Uh, a great number of photographers are going into the studio and taking photos of their work as well. And what with cinema and everything too, there are pictures, there are pictures, there are movies of, of artists at work. So we do know quite a bit. Uh, we, the collective academic community, uh, we, the royal, we, Mark Trovers, know not so much. Well, this idea of action painting, um, and, you know, the traces of the actions, of course, that's borne out with Pollock. Uh, Jackson Pollock, 
um, he had been in uh, psychoanalysis ever since 1939, right? So he had a Jungian shrink that was uh, introducing him to all of these ideas. So in this case, it's not just sort of saying, hey, these two things are similar, but rather it's pointing to the fact that, yeah, that, that's exactly what he was thinking. That's exactly what he was very much immersed in. And he makes these canvases, gives you a sense of scale, where you are literally in the painting, right? He's in the painting when he makes it. He's there. He's immersed in this environment. It, it fills his entire visual field. Okay? As it will yours when you see them. Now, he does do smaller works as well. But he's working his way towards these mural-sized pictures. And part of working on that scale, mural scale, is again this idea that it's not only about him. Right? Mural-sized work suggests a public. It suggests a public venue. And in fact, Pollock, uh, Gorky as well, had trained in making murals as part of the New Deal under Roosevelt in the 30s, but broke away from that. I broke away from the realist kind of art that they were making and into abstraction. So they're aware of the idea that art can play a social role. And the size of the art itself is, is part of the way that they're attempting that, right? Um, so it, it has a demand, right? It, it, it asks you to come inside. It asks you to enter this universe that he's made. Now, you know how he's making Right? We've all sort of know the story of Jackson Pollock that he's using non-artistic materials, um, sort of industrial canvases, house paint, right? Uh, sometimes they're uh, creosote painted things for the outsides of the house. And there's a metallic paint that one would use on, on lawn furniture, right? But not spray paint, right? Just buckets of paint. And he is sticking sticking sticks, and he's got pieces of wood that he is dipping into the cans, and then what he's done is he's mounted, what he would do, here's the process, right, is he would mount the canvas on the ground, not a stretcher horse, but just laying on the ground, sort of packed in the corners, and he would walk across the top of it, right, and bending over and just taking his you know, swing on the page, and so he really is it's interesting because the action of the painter now is one step further removed. It really is just out here in space, right? And sometimes he would use um, uh, house painter's brushes as well, you know, for some of the larger things. It's not always just a, you know, a one by, a one by four, or a one by eight, right? Not one by eight, one by six, right? Uh, Plank, but he would also use other things. And, and I should have brought a picture of these, numerous pictures of him at it, right? Smoking like a chimney while he's painting, right? The cigarette almost always out of his mouth. Um, he's also a raving alcoholic, right? So, sadly. Um, basically, died in the car wreck, they just probably both walk driving, right? right. That's, that's how he died. Yeah, and there's also a really nice movie. There was a great movie uh, with Ed, with Ed, what's his name? My wife had come to love him. It was up for an Oscar for playing it. I mean, it was terrific, but that was really quite good as hard as this goes. I think so, too. I think these things, I hated them when I was not that, but I love them now. Um, so here we are seeing without, without passengers. Um, what is, I brought here some details simply to, to talk about this, right? You can see the different layers of paint and how we, I think, becoming interested in how layers interact with each other. So we've got this kind of mossy green, right? And some white and some black and some peach. And then the, the canvas behind it has actually been painted with a single color too, right? So it looks like he's laid down this tonality in the back to begin with and it's splattered over the top of it. But the details I brought in, and this is something I didn't realize until I got here, right? I actually got to see that she might think it didn't mean that it's a very tight, but it's more of my old, like Cody Wild, Buffalo Bill Cody, right? You can put it just at the base of the box and you set up that yellow something. And you can find more in the desert climate in Wyoming. It moves to New York. And a lot of people have talked about Paul as being this sort of wild west. 
But anyway, he'll show you where these things are. But 
this is kind of over the last two pounds. Yeah. And um, right here in the middle, right there, it's rather large, and this picture doesn't do it justice. The whole clump of cigarettes, the cigarette pack, right, the soft pack, that he's been smoking while he does, and he just gets it in his pocket or something crumpled up, and his pocket and fell out while he was taking a hidden notice, and it's sealed down now by the pain, right? So there are these random elements, these accidents that occur, but for the most part, the work is incredibly uh, deliberate, right? Uh, and again, the idea of an accident, I think, is probably also part of that self-actualization. It's a record of the event. So number one, 1950. Here's quite a few around, and you can see just by the size of the drift, that obviously the scale here is just drastically different, right? This is just barely two feet tall, right? 25 inches is still two feet tall. Um, whereas you saw how big one was, okay, from this pain, it would be about here, right, by the scale. There. But it's one of the earliest of his of his drift paintings um, back in 1943, so seven years uh, earlier. And uh, how he developed the drift, why he developed the drift, certainly I think we've already seen around the year 1940 that European modernism and surrealism are really strong in, as influences on America. Keep in mind that some of the prominent Dada painters are still around, right? Duchamp's still alive. Not really. He's playing chess. <laughs> he gave it all up to play chess, right? Or so he told people. Right? That, uh, that, there's a wonderful picture of him sitting down playing chess with a nude woman. So that's just when you can go back to the early things about the nude woman in the staircase. I think it's very funny. In its way. So, yeah. Um, but he's out there, right? His ideas are out there. So, as, even though he's not producing art, that doesn't mean he's not a vibrant member of the artistic community and the scene and the ideas that he's sort of happening for. So, certainly, automatic painting, Dada ideas of chance, these are entering into the motivation behind Pollock developing this signature drip style. Uh, over and above that, I don't think I told you this yet, but Andre Nassau, maybe we did come up for it. Andre Nassau, who one of the first artists to do automatic painting, had actually moved to America in 1940. Right? So that's just in advance of Pollock doing the same idea. And this work is drip painting, right? Now he's throwing other things into it, sand and whatnot. But he's squeezing the paint out of the tube onto the canvas. And he shows up in America in 1940, right? A few years in advance of Pollock going here. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I just, that, that has to be some connection there between these surrealist ideas and where, uh, where, where Paul is heading. Um, sometimes with these drip paintings, uh, and these early ones have this wonderful sort of bluish green tonality. I think that really is lovely. Um, this one's up in Baltimore, also not all that big. Uh, but some of them take on these terms or titles. Um, that suggests subject matter. And this is especially true in the early 40s. He drops those references to subject matter later in his career. But here early on, he's uh, very much interested in the idea that these might actually have subject matter. And the, the terms that he uses are sometimes references to ancient mythology. Roman mythological figures, Greek mythological figures, that he somehow finds within the drift. In this case, it's a much more generic term, water birds. I don't buy it as a bird, but I think we've seen this idea of a water bird, a water fowl, if you will, right? Having some quasi-mythological symbolism. Um, you can also see in both of these the degree to which he's work the canvas, and then try to come back with the drift to follow some of the lines with the automatic painting he started with. Okay. Upper right corner of the Baltimore picture on your right, you can see that swirl of off-white that curves against the green and around that splash of red. Right. Now look at the drift that accentuates that. Looks almost like a musical notation. Right. 
talk about this, this area right up here, right? And you can see how he's already trying to figure out how to make the drip, how to control the drip, uh, to make it follow the form that he's laid down elsewhere. But again, like our surrealists, I think there's this idea of the open start. And those two red dots over there are things where he's done the drift, swirled, and then he looks like he might have come back in and, and, and painted the dots, or he's been able to swirl around them, right, in, on, on the left-hand edge there. Uh, so again, it's, it's incredibly practiced and it's incredibly controlled, even though uh, it has that sense of, of wildness and utter lack of any discipline. Right. That's the random against the case. Now, uh, Pollock's interest in mythology also comes from his uh, interest in Jung. One of the things that Jung said, he said that the collective unconsciousness is those root human characteristics that we all share. Then the collective unconscious is also the source for all of mankind's mythologies. They arise out of that unconscious. And they are different cultures' attempts to get in touch with it, you know, before they had the benefit of Carl Jung. That myths were a way, just as uh, uh, self-actualization is a way, to reach the collective unconscious. So what happens is, for Paulus, as he's, Diving into these canvases, creating these open areas, he's discovering something that has a quasi-mythological resonance. Because he's seeing them in that um, therapeutic uh, light. We're really lucky here to have a ton of polish floating around, right? Uh, throughout all of, all of his career. Um, here, uh, again, he calls it tiger. Uh, I don't think there's anything there. I think he's thinking of things like water birds and tigers as being more generic references to, uh, the wild natural state of things in a more primal, uh, space. Uh, he's discovering the collective unconscious, and that's where these things uh, reside. He said he was trying increasingly through his career, especially in the 40s, to veil the imagery, to try to make it more universal rather than anything uh, particular. Right? Um, when people discuss Pollock, uh, they often talk about the fact that Pollock's pictures are the first pictures that don't have uh, a subject-ground relationship. They are all over pictures, right? There is, even though the titles say things like water birds or tiger, there isn't a, a figure against the ground, right? And people who talk about American art often say, well, this is really a major breakthrough to thinking about art as not having, being something different than painting a subject that sits against the ground. And this is where Mondrian comes in, because he's been doing that already. He's been doing that for 20 years, 30 years already. That kind of calling his, his stride. And just like Masson had moved to America in 1940, something did Pete Mondrian. He got there in 1942, which is no coincidence, one year before Paul had started covering everything with paint. Now, it might look like an odd comparison, right? So rigid, so rectilinear. So much interesting in just the two primary colors, and yeah. Well, I think that there's a harmony here as well, but it's just, it's almost like this. You know what it is? That's the theosophical harmony behind that. You know, uh, the simplicity of it, um, and keeping in mind with Mondrian. One of the things that I think is so important for Mario that we talked about when we looked at it is that the white parts of his canvas are every bit as tinted as the non-white parts. And by that I mean, as we looked at these in detail, right, the little white bits of that painting have just as many deliberate and 
varied brush strokes as the small yellow, blue, and red bits do. Huh? Everything is covered with the artist making marks. Some of them you just can't see from a distance. And that is the lesson for Pollock. Cover every part of the canvas with a mark. And it doesn't have to be figure, it doesn't have to be ground. Everything is covered with, you know, the traces of the artist's actions. Well, um, so there's our, our, our brief connection. We have another uh, action painter to look at, and then we'll move into a different realm here. And that's Franz Klein, who I've always adored um, ever since I was in even an undergrad, is my favorite of the abstract expressionists. And that's kind of few of his works here. I'm really going to focus on just this one because um, they, I don't want to say redundant, but you get the idea after one. Now, sometimes they'll go into color, but most of them are these broad strokes of black paint against a white ground. And um, again, this idea that the gesture of the artist is the subject matter at hand. He's not trying to represent anything. Right? He's just showing you the traces of his actions. I've got some really good details of this. And you can see, I think, from this that what he's doing is uh, laying these strokes down with very, very large brushes. And one of the things we'll come back to, which also I think relates to Monterey, is the degree to which he's also painted the white parts. Now, he's set up that huge brushstroke, and this panel, this painting is huge. Um, it is, what, seven feet tall? Four and a half feet across? Right? It's a monster. It's bigger than that. Okay? It's about half again as big as that picture, uh, that, that, that protection on the wall. And he's painting, as you guess, with these strokes that they, these are house painting brushes, right? Because there's single strokes that come down and across. And so he's got these two to four inch wide brushes that he's using to lay these paint down. And again, dipping them in and, and splashing it on. And you can see the degree to which the splatter, not in kind of Pollock's way, right, but the spots that reflect how he's laying the paint down um, are really part of the subject matter. I'm fascinated by Klein and love looking at him in person because as you can see with this detail, he doesn't only paint the black. It's not like he's laid down the entire white surface and just come back over the top of it with black, but he's working both of them simultaneously. And I just find it fascinating because it looks as if, for example, this section of the white here is just put on the You know what I mean? So, it leads me with this picture, that this might be on top of that. And certainly here, right, there's the strokes of the white coming back on top of this, you can actually see this brush right? Yeah. And that means that it's problematic as to which one's my down first, what comes over the top of which. And again, keep in mind how do you do this as an artist and not have it sculpt in gray. Right? At the same time, these splotches that are up here and down here suggest that, in fact, the parts of this are definitely the end. Right? So, it's, again, it, it looks spontaneous, right? It's meant to look as if it was very quickly done, to just flop in there. But that is not at all the case. It's, it's really deliberate and, and, and really very sophisticated insofar as the uh, different levels of, uh, of paint application go. Now, he is in New York as well. All of these artists are in New York City, right? But he had grown up in, in, in uh, industrial Pennsylvania, uh, Wilkes-Barre, which is for Eastern PA, and uh, part of the bus stop, right? And a lot of people suggested, and this, I, thought, I looked for a long time to find a nice photo of Wilkes-Barre, where it gets a sense, that what he's actually inspired by for these structures that he makes with paint are these big cast iron, and right? this is a 30-ton crane, right? So it's a massive, massive, massive thing for moving things that are up to 30 tons heavy, right? And, uh, so the truck would move underneath it, it would lift it up and move it and drop it off, right? But if you start to look at the structures and the forms, you, you can see that it's not a, not a far leap. You can see that he's abstracted those. And working on this scale, 
right? Four and a half feet across, seven feet tall. This is that same sort of dwarfing monumentality, you know, that makes us seem small by comparison. Now, none of them are ever one-to-one correspondences, you know? It's not like, it's, oh, he paid the debt, right? That one there and things like that. <clears throat> but rather, I think, it's the idea of the starkness of those black contrasts against the, the bright summer sky that he's able to channel um, into these pictures. Now, he didn't always just dive straight in. I couldn't find a small one of these for local collection. But he would take pieces of scrap paper and uh, work out the gestures. So in this case, it looks like a part of the right? And working out those gestures small uh, so that he could then decide what compositions work well and then translate those or parts of them into the larger compositions, right? Um, and the story is told by the Cooney and his wife. And these guys all knew each other, right? Which is, I, I find this to be a fascinating period, like Paris in 1912, where everybody's there, right? right? Or 1921, when everybody's coming again. But New York in the 50s is just like these, they, they're all hanging out all the time. And the Cooney and his wife, uh, Elaine de Cooney, who her, is herself a very good painter. So is Paula's wife, by the way. She's terrific, right? But by the way, they think so far behind. Um, Elaine de Cooney tells the story that uh, what he would do is he'd draw them like this. And then he hit one of those overhead projectors, the old school kind that you had in grade school, where you put it down below and go cartoon, and it would shine it on the wall. You ever have one of those? You put a book underneath it and you could project it. You know, everything is digital now, right? But when I was a kid, you had these things and they kicked off heat, right? I mean, the lamp was as hot as the sun. And you would put the thing underneath and you would slam it down and they would show you things, right? Project it on the wall. So it was an opaque projector, they called it. And what Elaine de Kooning said was that what Klein did was he took one of these and he was playing with one of the machines once he saw the floor and was I need to do this big, right? And so he never really traced them that way, but that just inspired him to move from gestural small images to these massive mural-sized uh, works. The way he worked, and here he is, I'm going to give you a sense of scale. So this friend's going um, in his studio. Uh, the way he worked is that, just like Jackson Pollock, he didn't stretch the canvases. Okay? Jackson Pollock nailed his canvases to the floor and then stretched them onto the bars when he went to display them, but not while he was working with them. Right? And we just walked across them. But what Klein would do is put them on the wall. Same idea. Just, you know, hammer them up onto the wall, let them hang there, and work on them that way, and then eventually stretch them onto the stretcher bars when it came time to display them. Right. So he really is working across this. And I, I can't imagine how he's doing it without a ladder. Because look at the size of him compared to the size of some of those canvases. But they're all being worked out against the wall. Right? Um, massive house painter's brushes. And he's working on these things. Imagine the size of the studio you'd have to rent just to have this as well. Another thing that people have pointed to for Franz Klein as the inspiration, I think we talked about Will Ferry, we talked about Will and Will Ferry, and we pulled a projector. But another thing people point to is, is, is Chinese calligraphy. And I brought this with because it kind of reminds me of this that the large things are almost looking like they're letters in an alphabet or character in a language, in and of themselves, in the same way that a Chinese holographic character is more than just a single letter, but in fact contains a wealth of information and a wealth of material. Right? Uh, so people suggest that this too is part of what you're doing, but I think that on one level there's a crucial misreading about that, because Chinese calligraphy is to only work with the ink, right? You don't work with the, the page. You don't come back to the negative space and do something with it. But Roscoe does. Right? Roscoe vigorously comes back. It's not, even though it looks like, okay, stroke, stroke, cross, right? It just looks 
as if it's quickly guessed what was going to end. The black, again, the white fabric. It was obviously not the case. Look at the lower right corner of the large the right. Yeah. 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 Uh, you can see very clearly there that that little space between the space of whatever that is and the uh, stanchion on your right has been come back, he's come back in and painted over the top of it, right? So the negative spaces receive every bit as much attention as the positive spaces do. In other words, the whites are just as much painted as the blacks are. <clears throat> and again, there's this back and forth. He's painted the black, he's come over with the white, but then he must have come back over that with some black somewhere in order to get those splatters across the top of the white. So there's layers and layers and layers of work to end up with this illusion that it was just slapped down quickly. This is free associating, right? But that's exactly what Monet did back in the Impressionist era. His stuff always looks like it really quick, but he didn't. Those things are so worked up on the surface. It's almost like this is modern Impressionism in its way. Nice details here again. Um, in this case, um, it's never consistent, right? Some of the areas may be painted where the white is painted over the top of the black, that whole trapezoid at the bottom, I think, it's that. But other places, and this is now just uh, this little area here, right? Um, you can see that the white that is there is, in fact, behind it. And that you dry brushed over the top of it, with the black paint to gesture just over the top of that. So um, it's not like he's going to use the exact same technique everywhere on the canvas. But it varies it uh, area by area. Even here, uh, the bit at the top, right, this bit up here, is itself uh, the white behind the black, so two over here. But then down below, this bit down here, you can see pretty clearly at the bottom that the white has come back over the top of the black. And the black on top of the white. So he's really sensitive to the ways in which uh, what it, the paint is applied. And it makes what is ostensibly a very uh, simple picture into something that's really, really quite complicated. And again, um, this is you know our lesson, our lesson of, of Mondrian, who didn't leave the, the proportionate background thing behind the lattice work. The thing, the thing behind that structure of lines. I can say this like you're these paintings, right? The thing behind that structure of lines is as important as the structure of lines. And again, we saw this in detail before, but you can see here where all of the areas have been as painted as the color. And that's exactly what Klein is doing. And remember that Mondrian's work is not only was Mondrian there for a few years in the 40s, but his work remains there in prominent public collections in New York, right? particularly the Museum of Modern Art, which, opening in 1932, became a major venue for artists to study, to understand what's going on in art. That's why I want you guys to get downtown as much as you can. Well, that's uh, two, or two minutes left. I think we probably have about ten minutes of twenty minutes of talk. Maybe some time to do some reviews on on Friday, or just go home early on Friday. Either way. Um, so remember that if you, um, I'm going to be getting. I started to get the isms essays back to people and just going through them. What a what a what a floodgate of isms essays. People got to me at the very end. Um, and I'm going through them one by one by one by one. And I should get the rest of them back to you this evening, I would imagine. Right? I'm, that's what I'm shooting for. Uh, just go home and get my computer and hope the dogs don't try to create their tables, um, which they tend to do. So um, I'll be getting that back to you uh, sooner than later. Okay? So I'll see you guys on Friday. Professor, is the 